So once again, welcome everyone. And my name is Brad Neal, the Vice President of Business Development and Strategic Partnerships here at the Insurance Institute of Canada. And we're very pleased that you could join us today for what I know will be a very engaging discussion around biometrics and how they will help to shape the future of the insurance industry. You may recall we recently released a research paper uh, on AI and big data. This webinar will certainly add some color around the wearables and the biometrics piece for you. This webinar is part of a series that we've put together for people that are generally new to insurance. And by new to insurance, we mean people that are within the first two years of their insurance careers. Uh, this is a unique webinar because I think we're all new uh, when it comes to the area of biometrics and how they will shape the future of the insurance industry. Uh, there's no need to be taking copious notes on the screen. Uh, we will be sharing an email with a link to this recording for everybody who's an attendee uh, within a day or two of this webinar. So please feel free to focus on the content and we would love for you to share any questions you have uh, in the Q&A section of the um, screen uh, and we will get to all the questions we can uh, before the end of the webinar. Today, I am absolutely honored to be joined by Wemba Pota. Wemba is an artificial intelligence strategist at Microsoft. He's passionate about innovation and likes to explore the possibilities that exist on the frontier where technology meets business. For more than 15 years, he's been helping global organizations uh, reimagine and transform their business processes reach their digital aspirations, and capitalize on relevant business disruptions and leading technologies. Wemba has degrees in mathematics, artificial intelligence, and business administration from McGill, HEC, and the University of Burgoyne. Wemba sits on the advisory board of the Masters of Management in Analytics at McGill University and is very active in the Canadian startup ecosystem as an advisor and incubators a coach, and a mentor. It is my pleasure to welcome Wemba Pota. Wemba, the floor is yours. Hi. Good morning, Brad. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's an honor for me uh, to be here um, to, to, for this, um, this presentation, this webinar. I had a chance to, you know, to, to interact with Brad in the, in the past uh, years uh, or so. A pretty interesting conversation. And I think that uh, I hope that today we're going to be able to uh, to discuss together about the biometric and the future of, uh, of insurance. Again, uh, you know, expectation um, in an hour, nobody is going to be an expert in biometrics or of AI. We probably, Brian and I, we are not um, thinking that we're going to give answer uh, to all the questions, uh, but we hope that at least we're going to be able to to raise, uh, give some answer, but more uh, to really raise some uh, uh, question, have you asked yourself some questions and uh, uh, think about how you could transform the uh, future of insurance using biometric. You are new entrant and you know, what's happening now is that there is no playbook uh, for the area we live in. Uh, every year, new uh, breakthrough transformations, uh, things that are coming. So you are the ones that are gonna have a huge, huge impact on the future of uh, insurance uh, using the latest technology. Um, agenda, uh, uh, what we're going to try to do today, so right, quick word about me um, rapidly. So uh, as Brad was saying, I've been in AI for more than 20 years now, uh, been working in different uh, countries, um, Europe, Middle East and Africa, uh, Canada. I've spanned my career, spanned across three um, uh, CEOs uh, at Microsoft. I've been I've created my own organization, startups, my works on the banks and the financial services. Um, always very exciting, and I'm going to be happy to share uh, what I've learned and what I'm continuing learning um, on this uh, field using uh, AI technology and uh, um, financial services. Our agenda: um, one hour. We're going to talk about AI, about metric. We're going to talk about ethics and regular regulation. First, I'll talk uh, with Brad. Uh, we're going to try to uh, have a nice conversation, interesting conversation, I hope. And as Brad was saying, feel free to uh, ask your question on the chat window. 
uh, um, and we're going to try to, to, to take some time to answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, these are the, uh, the, the, the teams that we're going to be covering. So they can be very, um, uh, very interesting. We're going to talk about big, big data and AI. Uh, we're going to talk about things that you already know, uh, but or that you think that you know, or we're going to talk about things that you, uh, you have no clue what it means. Uh, but I hope that uh, after this one hour session, you're going to have some uh, 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 an idea of uh, how you could leverage them uh, in insurance, uh, in your personal life, as an individual or in your, in your future career. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to really uh, close the gap between where technology is, what it means, give you some definition of what we're talking about, and always relate it to a real uh, scenario or uh, industry specific use cases. When you're going to start knowing me, you're going to see that ethics uh, is a key, uh, very important themes for me. So we're going to try to cover it, it's going to span uh, throughout the whole presentation. And if we have time, we can also talk about what uh, all those uh, breakthrough, uh, the impact that it's going to have in your personal uh, career and how uh, it's going to impact your day-to-day your -day jobs. Um, so why talking about AI? Why talking about biometric and why now? Uh, we're hearing a lot uh, no, about um, uh, the impact of AI in the society, uh, impact of biometric. And this is normal. You know, you, if you have the feeling that everything is accelerating, it's not just a feeling, it's a reality. So if you see, obviously AI didn't start uh, in the last decade, uh, first uh, papers uh, on the topics um, uh, have been written on, in the middle of the previous century, 1945 and, and going forward. Um, but the last decade, we've seen uh, a very rapid acceleration of AI. And these are the, some of the breakthrough that are positioning us here today to speak about uh, uh, how um, AI is transforming our lives. So since 98, 29, uh, 2018, there's been more, but the, the four, uh, some very four important, so object recognition. When we're talking about human parity here, this means that a computer can do the task as, uh, as well or even better than a human being. So object recognition, human parity in 2016, uh, 2017 speech recognition, what does it mean? Is that when I'm speaking a computer, despite my weird French accent, a computer is going to be able to understand me better than you do. Uh, machine learning, reading, compression, human parity, uh, 2018, if you give a text to a computer, the computer is going to be able to extract um, uh, knowledge out of this, uh, uh, this text and read it as well or even better than you might being. Translation, now um, I think that some of you, you might turn off real life translation and uh, the translation is going to be made by the computer is going to be better than a human being. So all this happen because two things. First, the huge amount of data that is available to, to us but that, that a huge amount of data, this is what is what's pouring uh, artificial intelligence. So the second um, uh, things I want to talk about you is what artificial intelligence means uh, so that we are sitting on the same page. So artificial intelligence uh, is a huge, very interesting domain. Uh, it includes some subdomains. So today we're going to be talking about machine learning. Machine learning, why it's important now? Because machine learning, I'm going to explain you a little on what it means, but it's a subset of AI and it's now really a cutting edge technology because of huge, huge amount of data that we have. And in machine learning, we have another uh, discipline that is called deep learning. Uh, it's even go going further with a bigger amount of data. So let's go back to, to school and uh, let give me, please give me a five minutes to just explain you uh, what uh, machine learning is so that we understand how it's going to impact, it's impacting uh, uh, your life um, and your jobs. So we, we've all heard about programming, no, pretty straightforward. Pro programming has been there uh, for ages, even, even before the invention of computer, we already, were already talking about programs and algorithms. So a program is very simple. I take an algorithm is a way to process uh, information. I took, a huge, uh, I took that information, 
and my algorithm is going to put, process that uh, information, that data, in a predefined way. And uh, I will get uh, some answer as an output. Pretty straightforward piece of code, give me some data, uh, and then uh, I'm gonna give you an answer. You um, now when you, uh, your calculator is a very simple algorithm, uh, you give them a number and it's gonna give you a result. When we're talking about uh, machine learning, very simple. You just reverse the things. So now I'm taking a huge amount of, of, of data. I'm taking the answers that I want uh, to get. Now the computer is going to figure out the algorithm. So this is where it's interesting because I don't anticipate the way the computer is gonna do it. The computer is going to generate its own algorithm based on the, um, on the information that, I, that I'm having. So very easy, for instance, and a simple example, uh, you want to go from uh, Montreal um, uh, to uh, Toronto or Montreal to, to Halifax. And then you, you give me other possible routes uh, to go there. So this is the answer. And then you ask the, uh, the, the computer, okay, give me the best way to go from Montreal uh, to Halifax. Then the computer is gonna write the, the algorithm. Once I got the algorithm, I can't get a model. So once I have a model, it's that an algorithm himself become a model. A model is a way uh, to achieve uh, an outcome. And when I have my model, this is why it's getting uh, interesting is that I'm going to use that, that model to now predict. So I'm taking some answer, some data, I build a model. This model is, going, is now going to be used for predictions. So when we're going from uh, Montreal to, um, to Halifax, if, if I'm driving Montreal to Toronto, uh, my car, my GPS is going to use a, a model to predict, hey, when that based on the time you're living, based on uh, the car you're driving, uh, uh, the traffic, I predict that you're going to arrive uh, um, at uh, Toronto at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, today. So the computer can predict where I'm going to, to, to arrive. Okay, so this now you're expert in AI, machine learning, uh, very easy, um, nothing fancy. Uh, it's really, I'm, I'm using the, the data to build a model and that model I'm going to be using it for prediction. We're done with the first part. Second part now, biometric. So what, bio, what, bio, what does biometric means? And here I've tried to highlight in red, the, in color, the key terms. So biometric data, they are personal data. So something that defined me, as uh, an individual, uh, a human being, but like my 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 uh, my fingerprint, they become biometric data when I'm using uh, a way, when I'm or an automated way to process them. So if I take, for instance, uh, uh, physical or physiological uh, data of myself, and now I automate the processing of that information. This is why I'm talking about biometric. So um, there's been um, high risk fingerprints, uh, footprints that's been there for a millennium, but we didn't have the automated tool to process them. Now we have AI, we have strong compute power. So this is why we now we're talking about uh, biometric. So if I take a video on itself, it's not a, a biometric uh, information per se, uh, but if that video is high res, uh, high, high res resolution uh, uh, video or picture of myself, and I can scan my face and identify um, uh, uh, elements on my face that can uh, trigger automated processes. And we're going to talk about this automated process later on. Then we are entering the biometric, um, the biometric world, All right? So to remember, make it simple. Biometric data is personal data about an individual that, are, uh, that can be used to perform an automated task. So what um, are those um, biometric data more specifically? And what are the tasks that we can perform uh, with that information? So first scenario, uh, facial. I know that it's probably small. I'm not expecting you to go through the reading. You're going to have the deck. It's ready for, uh, for you to read that later. Uh, but I'm going to try to explain you what we're seeing here. So first, uh, biometric, uh, um, biometric information, facial um, information. And here, facial information 
it's not there are two type of um, uh, processes that I can do with my facial information. I can do it just like to um, to get information that are not directly related to me as an individual. So we used to call it maybe a PII, so a personal information, personal identifier information. So like facial presence detection, this is not related to me or to Brad or to any of you. The, the, the automated process will just say, uh, you know what, here uh, in this room, I got uh, 10 people and those are 10 human beings. So nothing personal. Facial character, characterization. So here I can say, I can infer attributes about myself uh, using that information. So if, you, if I take a, a, a picture of Brad, for instance, I could tell, uh, I could try to, uh, in, uh, to, to guess Brad age, uh, Brad mood, um, uh, other uh, characteristics, uh, characteristics uh, uh, about Brad. So this is facial characterization. And then I can also try to get some feature detection on, on, on Brad's face. The second what I put in yellow is now when we're talking about identification. So now this is where it's becoming uh, interesting and we already know it now. Uh, now we've probably all used uh, your cell phone uh, to uh, you unlock, unlock your cell phone uh, using your, your, your face. Uh, at Microsoft, we're using Windows Hello in the passwordless world. So I can just look at my computer and then uh, I unlock my computer. So my face uh, become uh, a password, uh, a way to um, uh, uh, verify me. So this is the three scenarios that you have in yellow facial verification, grouping, or identity, uh, uh, identification. Now you're starting for those, uh, this uh, facial scenario, pretty straightforward. I'm sure that you already have a lot of uh, ideas of uh, how it could be used uh, to automate uh, some uh, business processes um, in the global industry or in financial services. We're going to come back to it later. The other um, um, biometric data, is uh, speech, um, so voice-related uh, biometric data. So again, uh, divided into uh, area. First one, what you have on the top, nothing that, nothing that is related to me personally, so it's just to identify, you know what, is it when I'm hearing that noise, uh, is it a human being or is it just um, a, a car or, or, or um, another noise? Transcription, I'm talking and the computer is just going to uh, convert more what I'm saying to, to text. Then we have uh, again here uh, verification uh, or identification. Remember, my face uh, could be uh, could have been my uh, um, my passport. Same thing can happen with my word or with my voice and the way I speak. Uh, if you see a human being, you can anybody in this call, you with just two words, your best friend, you can identify them with just two words. So your brain, the brain is a very powerful uh, machine and they can make distinguish two people just with two words. But guess what? I've talked to you about human parity. So meaning that if a human being can do it, now a computer can, can also do it. So this means that with, um, uh, with the uh, voice um, identification, we can, my voice or the way I speak can become a, a, a password. And it, we can even increase uh, the, um, the accuracy of this identification, if I don't not just only rely on the voice, but I can rely on the on the uh, my accent, uh, the pace uh, with which I'm speaking. So now you see some uh, way that I can use biometric information. So my voice, remember, not only fingerprint, my voice is a biometric data information that can be used to perform automated tasks. So now start project yourself in your job. Imagine. Uh, you, I mean, I love to travel. And I remember once I was uh, traveling in Cap Verde uh, with my family. Uh, three years old son um, got ill, um, you know, uh, yellow fever. I had to call my insurance company. I was in panic mode. My first son uh, with my wife were young. And it took me like uh, 10 minutes to go through the identification process with my insurance at that time. Imagine if I could just pick up the phone and instead of spending 10 times for me to find, hey, can you give me your address? Can you confirm your phone number? Can you confirm your age? So that before getting to somebody who can help me, imagine if the system could just, hey, I'm Mamba Opota, I'm in Cap Verde, I'm with my son, we have a situation. Yeah, Mr. Opota, we can help you. 
because the system did identify me with 80% accuracy. So this is the type of thing that we could do with, um, uh, for instance, identify pe people with biometric. The other um, biometric data, your body. So your body can be can be a signature of yourself. You know, I love, I also love music. Uh, I, you know, the, I love this song, you know, Moving Like Jagger, uh, you know, <laughs> Mick Jagger. I'm sure that anybody of you, if you were to see Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger walking, you know, this is Mick Jagger. Oh, this is James Brown, because the way they walk is very dis distinctive. Well, this is the same for uh, even if you're not Mick Jagger, if you walk in a hallway using skeleton uh, tracking, using uh, gate scanning, I can say that, hey, you know what? This is Brad uh, walking. This is Brad coming by. So again, and this is why it's becoming tricky. Remember, my fingerprint, I have to give uh, my, um, we're going to talk about later, I have to give my uh, authorization for my fingerprint to be taken. Same thing for my Harry's. But when I'm working, anybody can scan me and create uh, uh, like a digital print of, of me uh, uh, without even me knowing it. So I hope that it's already lighting uh, up some, some thought uh, in your brain. And this is not science fiction. So this is uh, so Vatrix, uh, Vatrix technology. And this was done in uh, 2018, uh, so already three years ago. So they built a system, and here they're demoing the system that will recognize uh, and authorize uh, some of their employees just by them working uh, in the working in the office in the building. So now, uh, you know, I think we're telling me there is no the camera, there is no facial recognition. Uh, we don't we're not taking any of your personal information. But what, guess what? If I turn on this type of algorithm, I can identify a person uh, without uh, him or her knowing it. Is it good? Is it bad? Right now, I'm not here to answer. I'm just giving you uh, the state of the art when it comes to uh, technology, biometric information. So this is a uh, uh, gate uh, recognition. Then we go into something more basic that we already know, uh, uh, high tracking or iris or retina scanning. Uh, so those ones have been there for um, uh, for for many time now, uh, because of the increase of the uh, uh, accuracy uh, of the of the of the cameras, uh, it's easier to do. We 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 used to need a very specific uh, camera. Now with the high res picture, I can do it. And then again, here it's divided in two. So for each uh, biometric, they can either be um, uh, you become a PII or they can be just used at large. Eye tracking, my car now, the other day I was driving by, you no, know, I got a new car like 18 months ago. First time I was driving it, I didn't know that uh, eye tracking was implementing the car. I was driving and suddenly uh, I seen on my dashboard a report saying that, hey, Mr. Potter, you're not focused enough when, you, when you're driving. I had my son sitting uh, close to me. He was showing me things. Uh, on his uh, on his cell phone, so my eyes was going from left to right. So the, the car told me that hey, you know what, the way you're driving, be careful because I'm 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 seeing that you're not focused on the way you're driving. So this is high tracking, no personal information, and it's been it it, it became a safety measure. Retina scanning can also become a way to identify myself. Um, and again, here you don't even need to go that far uh, based on what I've told you earlier. Just my face, not only my iris, but my face now is becoming my signature. So iris or retina scanning uh, is, is less relevant now uh, because we can we have many other ways to identify myself. And the one, the last now, last uh, biometric data, hand and foot, we know those. Uh, what changes is now we have more the compute power. So let's say, for instance, uh, inking pattern analysis. Uh, um, I'm sure that you've been reading books of uh, Agatha Christie, and uh, when the, when she was, uh, you know, the the uh, she could recognize who was the killer just by reading the letter that the, uh, he or her wrote. At that time, you know, we when we know we were reading we were using pens. So the way I'm writing on paper using a pen, inking uh, pattern analysis can be a signature. Now um, my fingerprint can be a signature. Something that we we might not know. K-stroke pattern analysis. 
So you say Wamba, nobody is uh, using pens now, but you know what? When I'm typing a text on, in mode in, uh, or in uh, my favorite um, mode processing tool, the computer could, could tell if it's me typing, if, if it's my six years old daughter typing, or if it's my wife typing, or if it's bright. So the way I'm typing, the way I press the, the, the Q, W, T, the pace of me typing, um, this is a signature. So again, uh, you go on the internet, they say, hey, you know what? There's no cookies, uh, there's no tracking to identify you. But if I have to tap a wrong text, the server in front can tell you, hey, you know, this is probably Wemba coming back, uh, writing a review because uh, I'm recognizing him. So even if they're asking me, you know, the review process is anonymous, the pace I'm typing, uh, and then the system can recognize me. So here I'm just telling you this for you to be aware that there are many ways to collect your biometric data, even with you knowing or, or not knowing it. I know that in the insurance and the financial services, consent is a keyword, but sometimes it can be done without consent. And now you can try to figure out who, how those, this can be used uh, um, to transform your, uh, your industry and your uh, insurance. So this brings me to some uh, uh, use cases artificial intelligence and biometric um, uh, use cases in insurance. Um, some of them, uh, they are just AI powered, other I are biometric powered. So for instance, um, if I say any similarity to uh, identity pretty straightforward, so identity protection, we already talked about it. Uh, how can I make sure that it's me um, uh, logging in or, or making a claim? Um, fraud prevention. Now, fraud prevention, this is, can be both biometric and pattern analysis. So pattern analysis, I can uh, analyze patterns uh, based on the on, on some bi uh, biometric information or the, based on the one I'm traveling. So fraud prevention, for instance, I'm sure that you, I'm traveling a lot and many times, now I have to call my bank every time I try to travel because some they, they implemented the fraud detection uh, prevention feature. It went back. This trip that you're doing doesn't make sense. It's hard for you to open. How come uh, you are in Seattle on Monday, uh, two hours later, you're in Canada, Vancouver, three hours later, you are in Montreal, and then you're back to Paris. We need to block your, uh, you from uh, removing money. So this is fraud prevention using the, uh, how the way I behave. Same thing, the way you're buying. So if you I'm starting to buy stuff that I'm not used to buy, this can be used. Um, biometric, more biometric related. So we already talked about it. Uh, digit, digitized customer services. So I'm calling my uh, my insurance. Now we can save five minutes of uh, your, your your client by just automating the identification. Please enter your credit card number. Please enter your uh, your, um, your zip code. All this could be. Uh, you know, we could avoid all this process and really get to what matter for uh, my, my 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 customer. So those are some uh, use cases of using. Uh, biometric and AI uh, in your in the industry. Now the risk. Now it's like every tool that can be done for the better good or that can be harmful. I give you a pen. I can uh, I can use my pen to write a beautiful poem, or that been I can use my pen uh, to hurt somebody as a, a weapon. Uh, so this is the same with AI and, and data. And there are many ways to use um, uh, um, AI and data in the wrong way. Here, I'm just giving you one example, bias. So remember, I'm training my model. Now that you, you are expert in machine learning and models, you know that to train my model, I need to feed it uh, with data. The model is going to use that data uh, to, for an outcome. But guess what? What will happen if I'm using the wrong data set? So in this particular example, and this is a real case, it did happen in the US, I yeah, say, okay, you know what? We're going to use all the information. We have a huge amount of data. People that are already in jail. So we're going to use that information and to train a model based on the um, biometric information and all the information of people that are already in jail. We're going to try to predict if a person has a risk uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, misbehaving. But guess what, in the US, in the jail, the ratio representation, black people were overrepresented 
in the uh, in, in, in the in the present. So now this algorithm, if you are a black person, automatically you will be uh, qualified. You will be uh, tagged as high risk profile because of past data, and because we train the model with the data set that already had bias. So it could be done. So this is very important to make sure that you know we're using things for uh, on the right way. And this means to another interesting data. And we now we're talking about responsible AI. When I'm reading this, you say, you know what, when by yeah, this is the United States, or this is a, uh, uh, and this is a, 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 a particular example, uh, I think that we're doing better than that. But no, those are information, uh, a survey that has been done by Cap Capgemini, a uh, consulting firm in Europe. And they've seen that more than, um, you know, 80% of the organization that they've interviewed, they say that they had ethical issues using AI and using data. So this means that as we speak today, it doesn't matter what organization you're working with or you're gonna be working with, they are ethical, uh, uh, um, uh, ethical issues with the huge use, usage of AI and usage of uh, biometric and artificial intelligence, right? So it's a global problem. There is no playbook right now to avoid the situation, and you are part of the, the solution. So how can we be, how can you be part of the solution? First thing is that regulatory. You know, these are all the uh, regulatory uh, all the, um, the regulatory uh, rules and law worldwide uh, to try to uh, drive good behavior uh, and to certify uh, uh, systems. Uh, here, for instance, in Canada, right then we have the Canada Privacy Law. You no, know, it's a way. It's a it's a text that explains. Okay, this is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. This is great, but those laws they've been written maybe ten years ago, fifteen years ago, and even if they've been written five years ago, the pace things are changing. They're already outdated. So just relying on the law this, to decide if something is good or bad is not enough. Because the law. Ten years ago, nobody could tell uh, that uh, uh, you know I could use my uh, my face to unlock a computer. We are talking about password, so we, uh, there were uh, rules about or the way to use password, but not uh, you know um, uh, guidance about the way to use um, your, your pictures and your facial uh, facial biometrics. Uh, and then, so we try to go further. Instead of going from the law, we try to use principle. So I'm using here the example of the latest and one of, I think, one of the most um, uh, complete um, um, uh, um, regulatory text regarding um, um, protection of data. So for principle, personal privacy. So anybody should be able to tell, hey, you know what? This is my personal information, this is private. If I if I, would, I tell you this uh, an hour ago, you say, "Wamba, well, this is very easy. I'm not going to give my uh, my NAS. I'm not going to give my password. I'm not going to give my address. What about your face? What about the way you walk? What about your voice? So those are things that need to be considered because you can give them away without even uh, not, uh, not, not, not saying anything. Second element: control and notification. If something happens about my information, I should be informed. Well, I should have uh, any organizations should have a way to control it and to notify people that have been impacted. Uh, I was feeling my, uh, I, uh, you know, I think that a lot of us around the table, we get the, this message from uh, um, uh, uh, Revenue Canada, I uh, think that our passport has been stolen. I've been part of them, I had to ring it. So it took them, I, I'm not sure that it, it took them 72 hours to inform me. But now this is how far we have to go. Now we need to inform, as an insurance company, if there's a data leak, I need to inform, because uh, it's going to happen. It's not a matter of when, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of, of when. When it happens, I need to be able to notify people. Transparency and policy, you know, transparent policy, to make sure that people know what's happening. So this is why now, uh, when you log on a on website, now there's a lot of pop-ups Do want to accept cookies. You want to accept with tracking. Because cookies, you know, we are, we're talking about biometric data to identify you, but they are uh, digital data to identify you. 
So even if I don't provide my uh, passport, no, just the way I'm now do navigating, I'm, I'm giving a digital trail that people can uh, identify me. The one I like is the last one, training. So uh, what GDPR does is that, of course, you know, we know that uh, there's this uh, statement, um, uh, nobody can claim that you don't know the law. And now nobody shouldn't be able to claim that they don't know the consequences. So for this to happen, we need our organization to uh, get a proper a proper training uh, mechanism. So this is an example. What you can do on your organization, this is what we've done at Microsoft. So we've taken this principle. We say, you know, as an organization, if we want, let's start by the training first. But to train people, we need to, uh, to formulate what, uh, you know, responsible AI or responsible by usage of biometric data means for us. And you can uh, you can Google this, uh, the future computed. I, um, I can put, I'm go probably going to put a link uh, uh, on the deck. This is a book that has been written by uh, 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 our executives uh, to explain. So this is according to us, Microsoft, this is the, the principle of uh, proper usage of, uh, of, uh, of AI and biometric data. Next step is to, um, to contribute. So we've created, we have created a committee, the other committee at Microsoft, that committee say, okay, if we, if we have a, the feeling that something is not good, because the law itself is not good enough to decide should we move forward or not, let's create a committee with people from different backgrounds and that committee is going to decide if, we, if it's okay or, or not for us to engage to that direction. So this is, for instance, the reason why at Microsoft we've decided that we're not going to use facial recognition for um, um, law, inform, law enforcement organization. So our facial recognition technology uh, is not used by the police. Because at one point in time, we decided that uh, as an organization, even though the law permits it or doesn't deny it, we felt that uh, the system wasn't mature enough uh, to overcome bias. The last uh, third element is uh, advocacy. So you're going to identify things, you know, be uh, declarative, raise those, well, raise uh, what you're finding and be the advocate of your customer, the advocate of your industry. This is the way, this is the, the way we're going to be able to change more rapidly. And last but not least, again, I'm going back to training practice. So we build uh, a platform AI business school for anybody within any organization, they can come and get a high level understanding of the potential of AI biometric, the risks, and how uh, I should behave if I, um, when I'm doing on my task, my day-to-day job. So scaling is very important. And uh, take, quick takeaway, this is the way we've, uh, we've written our principle. So six principles, very easy to remember. I think that they, uh, they, they can be globally understood and used. First one is fairness. And you can replace here, when, I, when you're reading AI, you can also read biometric. Because for me, this is AI biometrics. Uh, AI biometric system fairness shouldn't treat, um, should treat all people fairly. So if, um, and very, it's very easy to bypass this one. Imagine now, we, we could definitely write a system that, hey, you know what? If I want to book uh, an Airbnb uh, hotel somewhere because of my, uh, my, uh, my zip code, because of my country, uh, because of all the information, then I'm not going to get uh, the same price as somebody else. And this is very tempting in the insurance. You know, why should Wemba pay the same premium as uh, uh, Brad or Greg or Neil? So we might think uh, this is for a better good when is going to get a better price uh, because uh, he's, less, he's at less risk. But that might mean that uh, Juliette is going to get a higher price because I'm thinking that she's more at risk. And if this, the system is biased, then the system is no longer fair because um, uh, Juliette is going to pay, to pay more just because of uh, um, a poorly trained system. Inclusiveness. A system uh, shouldn't uh, discriminate people. So the opposite of inclusiveness is discrimination. Doesn't matter your gender, uh, your religion, uh, your physical uh, um, aptitude, uh, you should be, uh, the system shouldn't put people aside. Reliability and, sa and safety. You know, a system is 
the responsibility of the people that are building the system, the algorithm, and here I'm including you, everybody around the table. It's not data scientists only who write AI automated system. I might have around the table people that are business analysts, business analysts, people that are decision makers, people that are developers. We, you are responsible to make that the system that we're building is reliable and safe. So sometimes, you know, just pause, think before bringing it to production. There is, uh, and it's your responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the developer, the responsibility of the manager or your CEO, it's everybody's responsibility. Transparency. Whatever you do, you should be able to explain what the system is doing and why it's doing it. And this is in, in the US, there's been that case where they've in, introduced a system to rate um, teachers using machine learning. And suddenly a teacher, Spanish teacher that has been, you know, that did get a lot of recognition awards for the last 10 years, decade, we turn, they turn the system on and that person has been underrated. And he was ready to lose his job and nobody could tell why. Yeah, you know, this, this is what the system tells me, you are performing. Any system that you're using in insurance, doesn't matter the industry, you should be able to demonstrate, to explain why it's, it's behaving like this. Privacy and security and biometric, this is key. Privacy, now you understand that privacy is gonna be very, very hard to maintain. There are very, a lot of interesting use cases that we can use, uh, develop using uh, biometric data, but do, I respect the privacy of my customer by doing this, of my, my peers, of the community. We have to think before uh, deploying it. And last but not least, accountability. Wasn't me. No, wasn't me doesn't work. We have to be aware if something bad happens, we have to be accountable. So an algorithm is written by a human being. So we should be able to up the chain and to know who is accountable for what's happening, the good or the bad things. So that's what uh, it was a, a, a long uh, intro, Brad. But this is what I wanted to you know to, to to do to really uh, bring people up to to pace. I got more slides. Maybe, maybe we can uh, we can pause now and uh, go from uh, for uh, some some Q and A and see how time goes by for more information. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was very insightful. I. I was not aware that uh, you can tell just by walking now. That's, that's very impressive. Actually, on that note, uh, you mentioned earlier about your iris scan and opening up your iPhone with your face. How many biometric tracking things are on my phone? I know I've got a fingerprint, I've got facial, and I've got Sirius. So there's three. Is there more? Yeah, there the, 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 the could be more. So this is the one that you're seeing. But if you see what I case truck, for instance, on your phone, every time you type on uh, a text message, an SMS, then the phone uh, recognizes you, could recognize you. So they're the obvious one, but uh, any of the files that I've, that I've, uh, I've shown are about metric data that can be, that are potentially uh, usable on your phone. Now, is the algorithm uh, on or not? This is another question. And we here, we're talking about transparency, uh, but yeah, there are more. Everything that are, any biometric data are listed can be leveraged by your phone uh, to recognize to recognize you. Wow. wow. Now, I've always heard that AI and big data is only powerful if you've got the right answers, or sorry, the right questions to ask. And I'm wondering, what are some of the problems that are trying to be solved? So what are some of the questions that are in the insurance industry beyond what you've mentioned already? Yeah, no, definitely. First, just a, um, a clarification. Now AI can even help you identify the right question to ask. So oh, wow. if I say, for instance, I have, uh, I'm in insurance. I have, um, I have um, um, a pattern. I'm seeing a pattern among my, 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 actually, no, I don't even see the pattern. I just give a bunch of historical data uh, to the system and ask him, oh, you know, can we identify some patterns? And can we identify for me something I should be, um, I should be uh, focusing on? So now the system can uh, suggest 
question that you should you should be asking yourself hey you know what maybe you should consider the um you should you should relate uh you you you, you premium to uh how the canadians are behaving are performing you know we are touring the the playoff seasons so the system could tell you you know during play, during the playoff season for instance there are some trends we think that we have more type of accident so the system can help you identify things that abnormal and where you should be focusing so this is one thing now second second part of your question and i've already started to answer it the question that you can ask you your, your system what i'm seeing a lot in the insurance it's everything related to prediction and to tailor-made services so prediction is that um how can uh, can i predict something that's going to happen can i predict that uh, um based on the way one by is driving can i predict his risk of um of having an accident i can now you can i use that information uh to calculate his premium or to give him uh, um, a reward or uh, an incentive or, uh, or a consequence okay so my takeaway from that was canadian fans have more accidents than toronto fans is that <laughs> or is that the wrong takeaway <laughs> actually um, I guess getting back to your transparency piece there, um, we know that customer satisfaction increases with AI when the customer understands what's going on. How would you relate that information back to a customer as far as using AI? And I'm, I'm thinking of, I call in with a claim and I don't even say who I am and they say, hello, Mr. Neal, how can we help you? That's kind of freaky in a way. Is that where people are going and how are companies dealing with that piece yeah. of no definitely and first thing we have to keep in mind is that we now our customer it's not only one persona we have different personas and we have different generations so a millennial generation dead for them actually the surprise would be hey you know what i'm calling you you don't even know me why are you asking me all these questions so basically you write brad Transparency is key, communication is key, but like we trying to, we have to tailor made uh, our our services. We have also to, we also have to tailor made our communication. So what we're doing is that based on who I'm going to, um, I'm addressing my 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 service. I'm going to communicate differently. So if my insurance tell me, you know what, Wemba, uh, today. You can use, uh, uh, we have a new services with this uh, uh, e, uh, e consultation, e health. If, you if, if you're sending the, uh, that uh, email uh, to a millennial versus you're sending it to a boomer, you're going to use a total different way to communicate. And you're right, if you use the right way to communicate, then you're going to increase your adoption. Okay. And, and actually, Moving that forward, when we think of insurance, we know it's highly regulated. We just got a question come in on the Q&A, um, and it's something I was thinking of as you were talking about the ethics piece, is how is this landing for regulators, or have you had any companies you're working with that have had to deal with regulators um, from the standpoint of using biometric data, specifically because the laws, as you pointed out, were written 10 years ago? So how are regulators adopting this new technology and how are they accepting it? Actually, the, the most efficient regulator nowadays is not the regulator, it's the public. So this is what drives be, uh, behavior in the organization now. And this can be a good way or bad way because some people can be too, uh, uh, you know, too conservative. But what's happening now is re no, regulator, I can check all the box that regulator is asking me to do. But because the regulation was written 10 years ago, this is, doesn't pro protect me anymore. So I need to anticipate what could uh, happen. So I need to, uh, how is my ultimate regulator, my customer is going to behave? So this also relates to accountability. So now, if I'm an uh, I'm, I'm, uh, um, insurance company, answering that, hey, you know what, I respected all the regulation and this happened, so it's not my fault, 
is no longer a proper answer. So that's why I think I, I really made the emphasis of we need to try to anticipate, we need to try to think ahead, and we need to get those principles. The six principles I, 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 I've written, those are the ones that should be guiding me even more than the uh, regulator. Okay. Okay, and I've got a couple of questions here. I'm going to put them together. Um, EY asked if the benefits of using AI outweigh the risks, but I'd like to put that together with uh, Anna had a question as well uh, as far as that benefits and risk. Uh, and I'll read this. Um, how does Microsoft apply the principles in practice when we see Microsoft Azure facial recognition using emotion prediction that we know it's hugely difficult even for humans to predict. So how do you use that kind of predictive model in an unstable manner when it has to do with human emotion? Yeah, no, definitely a uh, good question. What we're doing and what the, and this also goes to accountability uh, and uh, responsibility. What we're doing at Microsoft, we and Microsoft and the other, uh, um, no, there are six, five or six organizations worldwide, uh, mainly in the US and in China, that are driving the research and the evolution of, of AI. Right? And the technology is there. This doesn't mean that it has to be used. So at Microsoft, we know that, yeah, sure, now with the AI system, and I'm coaching startup, they are a system that can use, uh, that can um, uh, infer your emotions. But because um, is it uh, good enough to trigger some processes, this is where the risk comes. If the process that is triggered is, is the process that is triggered, the risk related to the uh, reliability, uh, related to the reliability of the system. So if I'm using like a, a mood recognition uh, algorithm and I'm using it uh, for fun in a game uh, to have my teacher kid laughing, uh, and saying that, hey, you know what, uh, that today you spend 30% of your time, you are angry at me uh, just because I'm recording you and this is about the algorithm tells me, fair enough. But I'm, if I'm using the same information uh, to say, I'm not going to hire you because the system based on the picture that I've taken, I'm seeing that you are uh, somebody that is uh, uh, has a negative uh, behavior, a negative impact or negative mood. Now this is, uh, this is where the risk come. So at Microsoft we say, and this is, responsibility and accountability. So the tools are there, but create related to how you want to use it. And this is everybody's responsibility. And this is the responsibility of the business uh, analysts that are going to match to map the possibility of the tools and the business scenario they're going to be used for. Okay, so if I can come back to Anna's question then, are you saying that Microsoft will produce the technology and it's up to the user to uh, see how they're going to use that or? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and this is why we've been working hard with a lot with the regulatory, re regulatory and we're pushing for more regulation because some people, you know, some people are, will behave in goodwill. Some people are more uh, tendency to take risks. So we need to, le to le get at least a baseline no red line that is common to everybody. Okay. I see we've got about five minutes left. I've got a couple of questions, but if there's anything else on the Q&A, please feel free to throw that on. Uh, the one thing I'd love to know, with the, when it comes to biometric data, especially if you can identify me walking down the street, it's who owns the data? That's a great question. And actually, it's a, it started by... Um, you know, this is the question that we are having uh, about uh, Instagram, about YouTube, about everything that we're putting out there. So who owns that information? The, 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 the obvious question is it's us. So it me, even if I, because we have to revert the uh, content, um, uh, the content mechanism. And this is what's happening now. Initially, if you don't say no, this means you say yes. What changes now, you know, in many dimensions in our society, is that if I don't say yes, if I don't explicitly say yes, this means I say no. So for my picture, the way I'm working, that if you record me 
and you can uh, and I'll never say that you can use that information to identify me. This means I don't want you to identify me. If I post uh, a picture online and I don't grant and I say that it, uh, it's public, then it, it's private. So on paper, it's good, it's easy. Now the, the complexity is how do I, um, I enforce this? Uh, maybe in another session, Brad, we could have a, 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 a webinar about uh, um, uh, um, tokens and uh, and um, the way to uh, you know to uh, really uh, uh, put um, identify uh, digital uh, information. So that another another topics. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And when I look forward, uh, the future you're talking about uh, has permutations I've never thought of. But how is that all going to change with 5G? Is it going to be that much faster, that much more? Does the world fundamentally change with 5G coming? Yeah, it, it, it's not only it's 5G, but it's also everything related to IoT. So now 5G is just going to, uh, is, it is going to increase the, the pace where, uh, of the information transiting. IoT is going to increase the volume. So you put them together, and we are in an exponential, exponent, exponential uh, usage of data. So now, if I'm talking about uh, biometric, for instance, IoT, now my car can recognize me, my table can recognize me with sensor. Remember, in the intro, I say scanning. No biometric, uh, a data become biometric if I, I can scan it. So now I can increase uh, the sources of scanning to increase the pace of scanning will increase. So you're right, 5G is totally going to change uh, the way uh, we data is collected and managed. And on top of 5G, I don't know if you've heard, um, uh, you know, SpaceX, they've launched uh, the five, um, the um, uh, rapid uh, high-speed um, uh, satellite internet. Now it's a okay. service that is going, it's gone live in Europe uh, yesterday. So it's not only 5G, now I can get Using satellite, I can get the pace of um, of four uh, G anywhere in the world, even in uh, an inhabited area. So connected at any time from anywhere from any device. So this is what we have to cope when it's working of data. So huge huge opportunity, uh, but uh, I let people around the table figure out what should be done. All right. This will be the last question. And uh, in light of the current cyber attack on the Colonial Pipeline in the States, uh, would biometrics be able to reduce that risk at all? Biometric, both biometric and AI. If you see biometric itself as a authentication or identification way is good, but it's not good enough. This is what we've seen. You know, if uh, in, in early, early ages, I remember uh, if you you were using a Samsung uh, phone uh, that was the first of using biometric facial recognition, you could uh, fake the system by using a picture, putting a picture, and then uh, you know you will unlock your phone. So you can't ask the system, but AI, this is what's going to increase uh, security. And this brings me to another topic that you're gonna be hearing a lot, uh, people. You now Google are being uh, zero trust. So now. We go into a zero trust world, mean or passwordless world. The, the we think that uh, you know hacking a system. We think that we need a very complex algorithm. But the majority of the hacks did happen because somebody uh, lost their passport or gave away the passport. So now going in a passwordless world, then this will decrease the risk of a, a system being hacked. But this also increases the risk of having my biometric data uh, on the world of waste, because any system now is going to use my biometric data. So I think this is a good conclusion, Brad, meaning that there's a lot of opportunity using biometric, zero trust, security, uh, tailor-made services, uh, not the um, scenario as limitless, but in the, in the other end, risks are also limitless. If I lose my password, I can change it. If my facial recognition of my fingerprint goes out, you know, I can't change my face. So this is the type of risk that we're facing. Wow. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much. I see we're at our time now. 
So to everyone who joined us today, thank you for investing your time. Again, the slide deck and this recording will be coming to you in email via link in the next couple of days. And Wemba, uh, thank you so much for your insights, your expertise, and your view of the future. Uh, that's really given us a lot to think about, about the new world of insurance. So thank you all very much for joining us. Have a great day. Stay safe. Goodbye. Thank you.